last talk of the morning, we have uh, Dr. Michael Ackerman, who's going to be coming and joining us about the cardiac channelopathies. And there's a lot of abbreviations here, Brigada syndrome, CPVT, long QT syndrome. And I am glad to have, I think, really a, a world-renowned expert on this to guide us through these. Um, I know when, whenever I get questions in clinic about cardiac channelopathies that come through patients or through my own knowledge gaps, Mike is the person that I turn to. So I'm glad to have him here. We're just gonna start off with just one pretest question. So we'll start off with just one pretest question for this. Uh, here we have leads V1, V2, V3. And then we have a question. Most commonly identified genotype for this syndrome, looking at leads V1, V2, V3 shown there, is what? A gain of function channel, uh, calcium channel defect. Loss of function, sodium channel defects. Defective sodium, calcium, and potassium channel beta subunits, or loss of function, potassium channel defects. See how the audience voted there. So the majority choosing choice two, but a scattering for the rest. I can say, Mike, this is a very important thing for the boards, and I'm really glad that we have you here to lay out a roadmap to success. Great. Thanks a lot, and it's great to get to be with you and all of you out in Zoom land. As you know, uh, I hear about this Team Getsky and Team Colon contest. Um, I actually joined my medical school classmate, Dr. Amon, and I always vote for Team Mayo Clinic. Uh, so uh, that's, that's my vote. Well, we have an hour together before we go to lunch, and I'm looking forward to our time together. These are my conflicts of interest to disclose. I don't think they're going to negatively affect our ability to do this well together, and that this well together is going to be twofold. We're going to look at the big three, the three major channelopathies, and discuss their presentations, diagnosis, and treatment. In doing so, we'll be selecting the appropriate management options when you and I take care of a patient with one of these primary cardiac channelopathies. I refer to you these guidelines, the 2013 one and the 2017 from AHA. The newest guidelines with respect to the genetic heart rhythm diseases will probably be coming out in spring 2022. I love this field. This is a subdiscipline within heart rhythm services, that of the cardiac channelopathies. The prototypic channelopathy is that of long QT syndrome, but it's certainly not alone. And there are many of them that are channelopathic in nature. And for the boards, and really for most uh, cardiologists' familiarity, we need to focus on the big three. And those big three are here. And we're going to take them in alphabetical order, starting with Brugada syndrome. So when you encounter a patient as indicated or brought to your attention by this ECG, and we'll talk more about it, how I want you to have this type one Brugada ECG pattern to get seared into your mind's eye. And now you have somebody with this ECG, exhibit A, he's 27, he gives us this ECG spontaneously. You did not need to move the leads up the chest, you did not need to give an Ajmaline challenge in Europe or a Procainamide challenge in the United States, and he just fainted in the hot shower you will recommend a prophylactic ICD as part of his treatment program, yes or no? So not quite like this amazing country of ours, beautifully divided. Here we have a 60-40 split in the yeses you would and the noes you want. And here, the correct answer is going to be, it depends. 
what rhythm are you perceiving that he was in when he fainted? If it was a vasovagal faint, you stand down. If it wasn't a rhythmic faint that you perceived, then you gear up for an ICD. Let's look into Brigada syndrome. So this is the syndrome that starts with this ECG pattern that is called the type one Brigada ECG pattern, characterized by this coved ST segment elevation. Some people refer this to as extreme J point elevation. And then this downslope ski, sort of a blue diamond uh, on a big sky. And that followed by an inverted T wave. That starts it. Now, obviously, if you have a patient who fainted in a suspicious way, gives you this ECG, that's Brigada syndrome. They could have sudden cardiac arrest. It strikes men much more than women, even though when it's genetic, it's like most genetic heart diseases, autosomal dominant in nature. And despite that, it has greater male expressivity than female expressivity with an average age of striking at around 40. I mentioned the type one Brugada ECG pattern, and that's to distinguish it from the who cares pattern. I don't care. Type two saddleback, type three wimpy saddleback. These patterns are non-diagnostic, non-specific, and we don't care about them unless they convert to a type one Brugada ECG pattern by moving the leads up the intercostal space closer to the Head. And if they do convert to a type one pattern that way, high lead maneuver, or in the setting of fever, or in the setting of a sodium channel, sodium blocker challenge test with ajmaline, flecainide, or procainamide, we largely ignore a nonspecific type two, type three pattern. So the type one pattern is the portal of entry. You must have it spontaneously or with fever or with sodium channel blocker challenge or high lead placement. And if you have that type one pattern and you fainted or did sudden cardiac arrest, that's Brugada syndrome, that's symptomatic Brugada syndrome, that is ICD worthy Brugada syndrome. If you own this ECG and so does one of your relatives, that's Brugada syndrome. If you own this ECG and you have a positive genetic test revealing a Brugada syndrome causative gene mutation, that's Brugada syndrome. And for the last eight years, we've been trying to undo something that was unfortunate in the guidelines, where the guidelines suggested that ECG all by itself equals Brugada syndrome. We've been disconnecting that link, but some people still have made that link. The ECG finding by itself is just a finding. You need one of these other elements to move a Brugada ECG pattern to a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome, where with that first question, 60% of you got it right already. In the bullseye of Brugada syndrome genetically is the poor forming alpha subunit encoded by the gene SCN5A that builds the ion channel NAV1.5 and loss of function mutations in that NAV1.5 sodium channel gives rise to Brugada syndrome. In fact, it's the most common cause genetically for Brugada syndrome, but it only explains 20 to 30% of all Brugada syndrome. In other words, most of Brugada syndrome, most of Brugada syndrome is genetically elusive. Yes, there's other Brugada syndrome susceptibility genes alleged. There are 23 of them to date, but by ClinGen, 22 have evaporated, have been deemed insufficient evidence to be called a Brugada syndrome disease gene. And we're left with only the SCN5A gene that builds the sodium channel, NAV1.5, as the only robust established genetic cause for monogenetic Brugada syndrome. And a little nugget here, in terms of that yield of genetic testing, it sort of depends actually not on the presence or absence of the type 1 Brugada ECG pattern, but the PR interval. If there is conduction delay with a prolonged PR interval, and the type 1 Brugada ECG pattern, the yield is 40%. If the PR interval, on the other hand, is stone cold normal, the yield of the genetic test is actually less than 10%. Now, how do we treat or when do we have an ICD indication like that patient? Well, cardiac arrest is easy. Cardiac arrest Brugada syndrome is ICD secondary prevention Brugada syndrome. Syncope meaning syncope that we do not like, 
a rhythmic syncope where our brain concluded it was a rhythmic syncope unless we had the benefit of a loop recorder telling us what rhythm he or she was in equals an ICD in the United States. In the Sammy Viskin world, my dear friend, and Israel, it might equal quinidine instead. The only pharmacologic therapy available right now for Brugada syndrome. But never a symptom, asymptomatic. Should we do an ICD? No, for the most part, no. You won't be asked this on boards. It's still highly debated whether we should even be doing an EP study for risk stratification in Brugada syndrome. And since it's so highly debated, let's forget about it. As I mentioned, quinidine. Quinidine is interesting, isn't it? drug that's very old, making a comeback, at least for Brugada syndrome, at least for syncopal Brugada syndrome in Israel and in other parts of the world. Now, why does quinidine work? You say sodium channel blocker. How can that work for a loss of function sodium channel disorder? Well, it's not quinidine's sodium channel blocking activity that imparts its therapeutic efficacy. It's the fact that it's also an ITO blocker, and it's, the, it's its ITO blockade that restores the balance at the phase zero, phase one upstroke in the action potential and has a role. And we might see an growing role in the United States. Time will tell. For those with symptomatic refractory Brugada syndrome, recurrent ICD shocks, there's clearly a role for RVOT epicardial ablation but caution, let's not be doing that in the asymptomatic individual just to try to make the ECG look better. Remember, fever as the universal Brigada irritant, we need to lower fever. Fever, hyperthermia, anything that increases core body temperature could be Brigada aggravating. And there's a hit list of drugs that we should counsel our patients to avoid. And this is a very effective, actively maintained website that has those drugs. Now, the non-pharmacologic drugs, the non-prescription drugs on this hit list that you and I have to be the killjoy for for our patients are the following. Don't get drunk. Alcohol in excess is Brugada dangerous, no marijuana, and stop your cocaine. So those three are takeaways, mean, meaning we take them away from our Brugada patients. Well, let's leave that and go to C for CPVT, that of catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and you'll see there's a yes or no coming on your screen. But here's exhibit A for CPVT. Never forget this. This is the ECG if it's on a stress test showing exercise-induced bidirectional VT or if it's just not a stress test but it's in the setting of a drug, digoxin toxicity exactly, those are the two main ways that you could get this exhibit A bidirectional VT. Now, if it's during stress testing and your patient gives you this, this is CPVT, but... If you wait for exhibit A, you're going to miss a lot of patients, a lot of patients who have CPVT. But let's look at this. Your patient, he, 23 years old, had a near drowning, suspicious. You didn't like it. He recovers, put him on the stress test, and he gives you this exercise-induced bidirectional VT. No doubt about the diagnosis of CPVT. And in his case, an ICD monotherapy is going to be indicated or recommended by you Yes or no? Beautiful, much closer to this divided country of ours, isn't it? So here we're about a 50-50 split. And here the, the point is symptomatic Brugada syndrome is ICD worthy. ICD worthy by itself. Symptomatic CPVT, on the other hand, is never ICD worthy by itself. And almost never ICD worthy period. Let's look at this and let's make sure we have a handle of that. So in the future, this vote now would shift to 100% would be no on this. The correct answer is no. ICD by itself is not indicated. 
I wanted you to say that because that sets me up to be able to talk about this fascinating genetic heart rhythm disease of catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or CPVT characterized by exercise or emotional triggered fainting episodes or sudden cardiac arrest. The heart is structurally normal. We say that it mimics long QT syndrome, but that mimicry is only because we're more familiar with long QT syndrome than we are CPVT. It doesn't really share much besides exercise triggered syncopal events because it's this as the diagnosis, that of exercise-induced bidirectional VT, because the ECG at rest is completely normal, or at least completely normal in a non- or pre-artificial intelligence way. That's a little teaser for the future. And importantly, don't wait for bidirectional VT. Instead, if you have that patient you don't like the story, exercise-induced syncope, exercise-induced seizures, exercise-induced sudden cardiac arrest, stress, the ECG at rest is normal, but you put them on the treadmill and please do that. We are dismissing way too many young sudden cardiac arrest survivors who never even got a stress test assessment for the possibility of CPVT. So we do that and now on the stress test, normal rhythm until heart rate 120, 130 and then it happens. And what's the it? PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, that start in isolation, then go to PVCs in bigeminy, might give us a couplet, might give us a bidirectional couplet as the workload and heart rate gets faster and faster, and that's it. That's CPVT. That's enough for CPVT. We don't have to wait for the pathognomonic feature of bidirectional ventricular tachycardia before we suspect and diagnose our patient of ha as having a disease of calcium-induced calcium release where we then order the genetic test to look for mutations in one of the largest genes, RYR2, that encodes one of the largest proteins that in us human genomes and proteome, that of the ryanidine receptor subtype 2, also called the calcium release channel, where mutations are scattered stem to stern, and they render the ryanidine receptor or these calcium release channels on the SR leaky. These leaky ryanidine receptors then cause diastolic calcium overload, and now you start to sense the, the interaction or, or, or resemblance to digoxin toxicity. Digoxin toxicity is the homologue, if you will, pharmacologically to this genetic disease of leaky ryanidine receptors that causes diastolic calcium overload that begets those delayed after depolarizations doc that Dr. Milperu uh, shared with us in the pre previous lecture. When we have that patient with CPVT, we used to be very ICD aggressive. Aborted cardiac arrest got you a defibrillator. I don't like my medicine, got you a defibrillator. I fainted as my portal of entry. Beta blockers don't always work, therefore you're gonna get a defibrillator. Or your genetic test just came back positive and even though you've never had a symptom, you're gonna get a defibrillator. Those are now all reasons that are wrong. In fact, all of the reasons should come off the list as a reason for an ICD. At minimum, never an ICD by itself. And even in aborted cardiac arrest, we're trying increasingly to avoid the ICD altogether because sometimes the ICD has become the direct cause of death of our CPVT patients from a so-called ICD electrical storm. So we don't use, and we should not use, an ICD very often in CPVT patients. I'm still okay if you use it after cardiac arrest, but never by itself. Instead, it's mostly a pharmacologic disorder where we use natalol as the beta blocker of choice, increasingly combination drug therapy with natalol and flecainide. Interesting story, can't unpack it, as to why a class one sodium channel blocking drug flecainide works great in CPVT, as well as denervation therapy. And that is how we treat most of our patients with CPVT. Now we have the 20 minutes and counting to spend the most of the time on the most common of the cardiac channelopathies for which there tends to be more 
board's questions to long QT syndrome. So help me out with this patient. You have no doubt about the electrocardiographic diagnosis, pretty impressive QT prolongation. And she is 35. She fainted while running on the treadmill. You are picturing a rhythmic syncope from the circumstances. You diagnosed her as having long QT syndrome. You even suspected based upon your T-wave analyses that it was going to be LQT1, and you're right, the genetic test came back positive for LQT1 causative variant two weeks later. That's her QTC at rest, 503 milliseconds. And with that, will you be recommending an ICD? Yes or no? Now we're starting to have a shift. Some of you are getting the sense that we don't need an ICD very often for the genetic heart conditions. And here, I'd like to contrast symptomatic Brugada syndrome. Yeah, ICD, I'm okay, 100%. Symptomatic CPVT, answer never, almost never. Now symptomatic long QT. That's gonna turn out to be, it depends. In this case, symptomatic LQT1, I want you to become really comfortable and confident that she can be treated with a non-defibrillator strategy and can be treated very well. So for her, I would suggest that the correct answer is absolutely no, she doesn't need an ICD. But if we mutate this sentence a little bit and make her LQT2, not so fast. She could be a good candidate for ICD protection. Now, we know a lot about this disorder. Next year, we'll be celebrating the 65th anniversary of it. We're past the quarter century mark since this entire discipline of cardiac channelopathies were birthed. First genetic test for long QT syndrome now 17 years ago, and you can see gone to the place of no longer and long ago, no longer a research genetic testing, but clinically available, commercially available, clinically indicated genetic testing, where I'll tell you who needs to get the genetic test in a few slides, but it's really easy. If you're going to diagnose somebody as having long QT syndrome, they must receive long QT syndrome genetic testing. All of the guidelines indicate that as a class one recommendation for this disorder. Affects about one in 2,000 individuals, maybe higher, maybe as high as one in 1,000 who have long QT syndrome, where they may or may not show QT prolongation. They may or may not ever have a torsadogenic experience of torsadogenic syncope, syncope followed by seizing or syncope followed by ceasing and sudden cardiac death. Two-thirds of all the patients that I see with long QT syndrome are waiting for their first symptom. And so the focal point of it is the story. What is their story, especially if they bring to us a story of a cardiac event, a syncopal episode, and now you and I in our mind's eye are having to decide, what do I think about that spell? Was that vasovagal syncope? Or was that arrhythmogenic syncope where in this woman in the postpartum period with this presence of an auditory trigger called an old telephone that some of you may not recognize triggered the episode of going from QT prolongation to her torsadogenic experience where hopefully the torsades would be self-limiting rather than progressing in a tragic way. We have to picture the story. We have to determine what we think about that faint. And when we thought that that faint, as shown here, is an arrhythmic faint, we need to have game on. Snap two, fainting can spell trouble. At least this leading scientific journal, Glamour, told us so. And indeed, in long QT syndrome, it does. It is the strongest it syncope, arrhythmic syncope, torsadogenic syncope, is the strongest predictor of a future event future worse than almost any other risk factor. So pay attention to every patient who has a syncopal episode. Decide whether it was a who cares vasovagal faint or yes, I really do care a torsadogenic faint. These are the kind of faints that we should be bothered by. Exercise timed, emotionally triggered, occurring in the postpartum, auditory activated. These syncopal or seizures are malignant until proven otherwise. 
I mentioned seizures. It's really not epilepsy, but we've had many long QT patients and CPVT patients get misdiagnosed as epileptics treated with anti-epileptic medications. So remember, exercise triggered seizures before the neurologist commits the diagnosis of epilepsy, let's make sure we start thinking about the organs south of the brain and, and do the appropriate testing, an ECG, not an EEG, for that exercise-triggered seizure episode. Then we start the evaluation, and the cornerstone of the evaluation has been and will remain the 12-lead ECG at rest, where we're looking for the feature of abnormal QT prolongation problem. This little thing about the QTC, we're not so hot at it. The computer's not always so accurate with it. And we, the adjudicators, the cardiologists who determine it, as Sammy Viskin uh, soberingly showed us 15 years ago, aren't so good at it. But you will be good at it because I'm going to give you some nuggets to be good with the QTC. We start with having us independently confirm what the computer said was the QTC. So we teach the tangent, we avoid the tail, where we take the isoelectric segment, go down the downslope of the T wave and intersect it there and resist the urge of committing what we call the sin of QT inflation from U wave inclusion. And let's add to those five, let's add five pearls to that. And in doing so, you will instantaneously be better than the majority of all cardiologists out there and many heart rhythm specialists in your ability to censor the QT interval more accurately. First pearl is use lead two and V5 when you independently confirm the QTC. Largely ignore, stay away from V2 and V3. Go down to that rhythm strip at the bottom and put your eye or your cal calipers in V5 there. March it down. See what QT interval you're doing and then compare it to the computer's QT. If that your QT and the computer's matches each other, you've confirmed because the computer does a great job of determining the RR interval and doing mathematics. But if your QT is not matching the computer's, then you have to figure out why. What are you seeing that the computer is or isn't seeing in the assessment of the QT interval? Know on the fly that if that QT interval is less than the RR interval, that preceded it, the calculus will always give you a QTC less than 460. That doesn't mean you've ruled out long QT syndrome. That just tells you on the fly that the QTC will be under 460 whenever your QT is less than half of the preceding RR interval. Now, in the setting of sinus arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation, don't do maximums and minimums you're gonna grossly inflate the QTC. Take the average QT. The computer, again, averages the sinus arrhythmia or the atrial fibrillation, and it does an average RR pretty well. But take the average QT. Don't find a maximum QT, otherwise you will grossly inflate. And then remember that a patient's QTC reality breaks down at low heart rates and at fast heart rates. In bradycardia, you will underestimate their QTC truth. At high heart rates, you will overestimate their QTC truth. And then the bonus pearl. First, if you have to do a wide QRS adjustment, it, the patient for sure doesn't have congenital long QT syndrome. But this is in the setting of you're trying to make an assessment of what is that QT prolonging drug effect in the setting of a patient who has a wide QRS. So there's many formulas. I like simple. Simple is just to do a wide QRS adjustment and do a correction. Subtract 120, that will be quite sensitive. Some people subtract 100 to make it more specific so that we don't make some overcorrections in this setting. In other words, the patient's QTC is 560. It's a correct measurement, but within that, the QRS, because of a paste rhythm or bundle branch block, the QRS is 220. So in this case, 560 would seem spooky but it's really not because with a wide QRS correction, it's only 460 milliseconds. I say only, and that brings us to this. You and I have to decide 
when the length of repolarization is wrong. But before we look at length, and you'll tell me what you think about 475, there's also the look of repolarization. Do you like this look? So it's not only the length of the QT interval, it's the look of the QT interval. And there are certain looks, and we'll come back to these, that will help you in your genotype ECG T-wave phenotype assessment. Broad-based T-waves, LQT1, humped, bumped, double-notched, LQT2, normal T-waves after a long ST segment, LQT3. So you might get that and you say on quick recall, I know this patient is clearly LQT3, isn't she? Here's a very long ST segment, a narrow, normal-looking T-wave, but this patient never bothered reading that paper. So that's a gotcha moment. It's great for the boards. It would be the perfect answer for the boards. Doesn't always hold up in reality. Here's one that I need your help with. The QTC here is 415. Are you bothered at all by this length of repolarization? What about the look of repolarization? So to you, is your ECG diagnosis normal or abnormal? And let's see if we're queued up uh, to ask this. Well, we didn't. So that is normal. It's perfectly normal. I hope you agree it's normal in a patient who absolutely has long QT syndrome genetically. And this is why that you must do genetic testing in all family members regardless of their ECG. There is no ECG that is normal enough that you could tell them, no worries, you don't have the family mutation. So for you, when do you think a QTC then is too long? When are you bothered by the length of repolarization? Are you there at 420, 440, 460, 480? Who will give me 55, 500? Which threshold of QT bothers you? And let's see where we're at with that. And I was hoping we would get a blend like this. Sometimes we get actually a beautiful Gaussian distribution, which is uh, 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 interesting because we have this metric of cardiac repolarization called the QTC, and we need to know what it looks like in health, male health, and female health, and in disease, in congenital long QT syndrome, you see the average QTC. When it's way out here, no problem, but you'll hardly ever see that in your practice. 600 used to be a line of high risk. It's high risk, but you'll never see that in your practice. 530 then became the high risk line, but the line that matters now and forevermore is the 500 millisecond line. In your practices, never blow off the QTC 500 millisecond individual. Assign high respect to that situation. And we'll come back to that high risk indicator. But then you see what happens with this overlap zone where we have normal QT interval, long QT syndrome, and how normal can you go? That's our indoor record of being mutation positive, shall I say pathogenic variant uh, positive, and yet they own the long QT variant. Juxtaposed to that, we then have this conundrum, don't we, of the 440 line for which we call that, yes, borderline. I hate that. Borderline QT prolongation, which so often gets incorrectly mutated to possible long QT syndrome. Because we have a lot of individuals on the planet who have borderline QT prolongation by definition, about 10 to 20 percent of the globe. And then we change the borderline and we drop it. And for men at 450 and women at 460, we now call that satisfying the guideline-based ECG definition of QT prolongation. And if that is all our patient does is satisfy that guideline and there's no story, no nothing else, nothing else, the likelihood of actually having long QT syndrome at those cut points is less than a 1% positive predictive value dangerous to use that, but not dangerous to respect 500 milliseconds a lot. There's basically only two reasons why it's okay to be above 500. Bundle branch block, something that you need to do a wide QRS adjustment for, or 
presence of amiodarone. Besides those two reasons, almost any other reason puts our patient into increased torsotogenic potential, increased risk for sudden cardiac arrest. Respect 500, if you can't blame it away on hypokalemia and so forth, it is long QT syndrome until proven otherwise. Then if you were to ever invoke screening uh, conditions, those would be 480 in women, 470 in men, and 460 before puberty. Those have moved into yellow light territory. That's not long QT syndrome, but it is long QT syndrome about 10 to about 10% of the time. So if one were setting up a screening program for the early detection of long QT syndrome, we and others would be advocating 480 in adult women, 470 in men, and 460 before puberty. And in doing and in suspecting long, suspecting long QT syndrome, we then would be starting genetic testing as a class one indication. And the majority of the time, over two thirds of the time, you will find loss of function mutations, loss of function mutations in one of two voltage gated potassium channels in the heart like this one shown here. Long QT genes are now up to 17 or 18, but some of those have been uh, clingen uh, canceled, if you will. And the ones that matter for boards and really for practice are the three majors of LQT1, 2, and 3. LQT1 and 2, potassium channel, loss of function potassium channel, and LQT3. What's the yield before we then finish with our focus on treating long QT syndrome and the different long QT syndromes? Remember Brigada syndrome, 10 to 40 percent, really 10 or 40 percent based on the PR interval. CPVT at least 60 percent, probably closer to 65, 70. Long QT syndrome, at least 75%, perhaps closer now to 85 to 90% even with the current generation genetic test. The guidelines, as I refer to, are straightforward. If we're going to call a patient long QT syndrome because of the impact of finding the root cause, the pathogenic variant, not so much for short QT syndrome, that's why I haven't even talked about that entity, but clearly for the impact across the triad for long QT syndrome, genetic testing is a class one indication. And the words are here in the guidelines, but it basically says, if you're gonna call a person long QT syndrome, you better do long QT syndrome genetic testing. And here, if you've been slipping away, come back to me for the last few slides here because these are high, high yield real estate for the boards. LQT1, the most common of the long QT syndrome, about a third of all of our families, loss of function mutations in the KCNQ1 encoded IKS current of phase three. LQT2, Second most common, 25 to 30 percent, loss of function mutations in the KCNH2 encoded IKR current, and then LQT3, leaky sodium channels, gain of function in the SCN5A encoded NAV1.5 sodium channel. Five to 10 percent of our long QT patients have these leaky sodium channels. Well, uh, there's minor long QT subtypes, but who cares? There's important ECG pattern recognition, as I alluded to a few slides ago. Broad-based T waves, think LQT1. Hump, bump, notch T waves, think LQT2. Normal-looking T waves, think LQT3. There's gene-specific triggers. It happens during swimming, running, track, think LQT1. The event happened during auditory triggers, alarm clocks, being spooked, think LQT2. It happened in the postpartum time period, think LQT2. You don't know when and where, there's no particular triggers to it, it think LQT3. Gene-specific responsivity to beta blocker therapy is clearly there. Beta blockers work great in LQT1, they work in LQT2, and they do work, but not as, not with the same therapeutic efficacy as potassium channel mediated long QT syndrome in 
LQT3. So beta blocker therapy is the pharmacologic treatment of choice. Like in CPVT, use natalol. If you don't have access to natalol, use the other non-selective beta blocker of propranolol. Don't use, in any genetic heart rhythm condition, the beta-1 selectives of atenolol or metoprolol. Thank you if you choose to follow that recommendation. I am not only thank you, but so will your patients and their families. For LQT3, we, we uh, modify the therapy a little bit with propranolol as the beta blocker of choice and mixilatine. Real quickly, don't miss this website. It's now kept most accurate under creditablemeds.org. This is a list of QT prolonged medications that our patients, if they're gonna be treated with any medicine on these hit lists, they must have your or my approval before doing so. The defibrillator, what about that? Most patients with long QT syndrome do not need and should not receive an ICD. Who does? Okay, I'll give you aborted cardiac arrest as a reason, secondary prevention, yes. Treatment intolerance, uh, we have better therapy, so if they're not liking their beta blocker, don't go straight to a defibrillator. Predicting the future, then it has to be really long. What is the IT, the QTC at rest, and not LQT1. We don't have to be as long for the QTC in LQT2 women, but importantly, unlike what you heard the other day from Dr. Amon in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where family history is one of the canonical risk factors, it is not in long QT syndrome. And also LQT3 should not be a direct line to the ICD any longer as well. Last, juxtaposed between devices on the right and drugs on the left, is denervation, that of left cardiac sympathetic denervation. The antifibrillatory effect of denervation is clear. We do more LCSDs at Mayo Clinic than anywhere in world. And in doing so for the last 15 years, we've been doing it in these indications now codified by the guidelines. Appropriate shocks, you are a candidate for denervation therapy. I don't like my beta blocker. I just had an, a long QT triggered event on my beta blocker. You're eligible for denervation therapy. And then for those that we deem sort of as a bridge in terms of our risk assessment of them. Well, this completes our sojourn through the big three of Brugada syndrome, CPVT, and then finally, long QT syndrome. And if I could leave you now, I, we've covered the board's real estate for the first 35 minutes. Let me take two minutes, one minute, to give you four take-home points for your practice where you will save lives by heeding these take-home points. First, remember prevention saves. Use and know those websites of creditablemeds.org for QT prolonging drugs and the Brugada drugs hit list. Remember that tailoring of therapy is not only possible, but it's essential, as most of our patients with genetic heart rhythm diseases do not need and should not receive an ICD. Then remember that beta blockers is the pharmacologic therapy for most of our channelopathy, certainly long QT and CPVT, but all beta blockers may not be created equal. I say caution with atenolol and metoprolol. I give you the avoid once a day as the minimum request, but I think let's go bold and just say, stop using atenolol and metoprolol for these genetic heart rhythm patients. And then last, remember denervation therapy for those malignant cases. Don't just let the ICD keep firing. Thank you so much. And I'll come over to Dr. Geske for some questions. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Mike. It's always, I always learn something from your lecture too. It's uh, certainly something that I know I can do better on and it's great to have someone with such knowledge and expertise here. Let's uh, go through that uh, one pretest question and then I think that you actually have some other questions here too, right? I do, in fact, the pretest is coming up. But, okay. But I wanted to give it a little delay so there's not immediate recall. Oh, all right. So I'm like even that. penalizing myself a little bit I like, no, from, I, the, from that step up function. I'm on Team Ackerman. Like, yeah. like let's, 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 let's just be real. All right. So what inheritance pattern do we see here? So we've got, we've got some, some individuals who have red here who are positive. 
and look at this picture and then choose what is the inheritance pattern that we see. X-linked recessive, autosomal dominant, sporadic, or autosomal recessive. So we're going to start the voting. Okay, so the majority chose autosomal dominant. Let's just take a look. Actually, we'll go back and show the pedigree a little bit. So you can leave it there. right there. And I'll, and this is a great one. This was kind of like the question you asked Dr. Mulpru is with that VT and history of ischemic. In genetic heart diseases, if in doubt, always say autosomal dominant. That is the genetic inheritance pattern for almost all of the major genetic heart rhythm diseases, heart muscle diseases. Uh, aortopathies and so forth. And in here it showed you that the dad was variant positive. We used to say mutation positive, but that's so incorrect now politically. Oh. So we're no longer mutants. Oh. By guidelines, we possess pathogenic variants. He, the dad, has the pathogenic variant. The disease causative pathogenic variant would be the full officially correct expression. And then three of his four children did and do as well. And one daughter was variant negative. Even though both of the dad's parents are negative, you don't quite see the grandfather up there, but they both tested negative. This is autosomal dominant, in this case with a pathogenic variant originating in the biological father as a sporadic de novo variant, as long as his parents are correctly assigned. So that's, we don't need to go into that. That might be too unsettling for some people. Just because just they're drawn there doesn't mean that that's what happened. Just because they're drawn there doesn't mean that that's what happened. Mm. And I think it might be too disturbing to our audience to know just how often paternity is not correct. How, well, I think so. Maybe, that, I mean, maybe you, we'll you have to them. share. You can't just dangle it like that, Mike. I, I know, but it's, it's sort of, uh, maybe that's Google worthy and that'll really mess people up. But it is about 10%. In genetic testing circles, about 10% of the time, paternity is not confirmed. It turns out that the mom is almost always the mom. <laughs> but there are some exceptions to that as well. But, uh, and that it, it, we were making a little light of it, but it's actually quite an important aspect of genetic heart rhythm and genetic heart muscle clinics is to delicately discuss these issues. And that's why being teamed up with genetic counselors is, is such an important part of the practice of genetic cardiology. Yeah, that team approach is really critical. But now I'm really excited about this second one because this will see with a little with people now being distracted a little bit, what yeah. what's the step up with this one? All right. So we've seen this question V1, V2, V3. We're looking at this. What is the most commonly identified genotype for this syndrome? Gain of function calcium, loss of function sodium, defective pan sodium calcium potassium channel beta subunits, or loss of function potassium. Got some quick voters in there. Just wait for the for a few more. Ooh, that's really good, Mike. That's really good, isn't it? I must say, we went from sixty to ninety-two percent. Yeah, it's it's not an easy question. No, but you really guys, bright you, audience. you men and women out there did amazing, and this step-up function is really good on you. So again, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the ECG that allows us to talk about Brugada syndrome and consider it. The only Brugada syndrome worthy gene to date is the sodium channel and it's loss of function mutations in that sodium channel that account for about 20 to 30%. Remember we said 10% if the PR is completely normal, 40% if the PR is prolonged. The other ones are different entities. So just for fun, number one is type eight long QT syndrome or the syndrome called Timothy syndrome. Number three deals with sort of LQT nine through 14. And number four, loss of function potassium channel defect. You know that already. That's the majority of the explanation of long QT syndrome. 
that was good. So now we've got that same ECG looking at the same leads here. What are we going to use as far as pharmacologic agents or maneuvers to treat this syndrome? Quinidine, ashmaline, procainamide, hyperthermia. All right. Excellent. Now, it wasn't a huge vote, but what is ashmaline? So ashmaline is a sodium channel blocker agent that's routinely used in Europe. Oh. So it's not available in the United States. So it would be our choice for ashmaline is procainamide or flecainide. So numbers two and three are sodium channel blockers that are used as provocative tests for the patient with a quasi-suspicious story, a non-specific ECG to see if that drug challenge exposure will bring out a type one Brugada ECG pattern. There's no need to do an ashmaline test if the person gave us the diagnostic spontaneous type one Brugada ECG pattern to begin with. So there's a question here from the audience. If a patient demonstrated a Brugada pattern, do you routinely get a cardiac MRI? To look, at, uh, to look at various things, or is that not a major part of what you do? Oh, I love that question. We normally don't, but what that person who, who is quite uh, astute, whoever he or she is, is we have started to think of Brugada syndrome as not just a genetic arrhythmia syndrome in the setting of a structurally normal heart, but a congenital heart defect, should we say, of immaturity or disease of the right ventricular outflow tract. And some of these patients with Brugada syndrome will have fibrosis in the RVOT. Some of the Brugada syndrome patients do and can progress to dilated cardiomyopathy. So I think imaging makes sense. And so we would, we would periodically do an echo. I think the need of cardiac MRI is probably pretty low. We're not finding use of the imaging-based information to intensify or stand down with our treatments. And so it's kind of window dressing right now, I would say. It gives more information, but it's information that we don't, it doesn't appear that we need that badly right now. And then there was one question that came through about the pedigree uh, uh, that Ulya showed. So if you have a, a carrier of an autosomal dominant mutation, what amount of the, of the children would you expect to, ex to have that gene then? Would it be 50%, 75%? What, what, what would you expect to see in a pedigree uh, with an autosomal dominant? Yeah, let's, uh, let's keep that a secret for about three more slides. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Your patient is a 40-year-old male with a history of fainting spells, and this spontaneous ECG, what is your first line of therapy? And we should probably qualify that in the U.S. of A. In the U.S.A., okay. Yeah. All Great. right. So I think what we're trying to point out here is that let's assume that we've concluded that you and I don't like the faint, that it sounded rhythmic, concerning in nature. So now we would call this gentleman symptomatic Brugada syndrome. And symptomatic Brugada syndrome with that Brugada pattern showing up anytime you get an ECG rather than hit or miss transient, in the United States, that would be a class indication for a prophylactic implantable defibrillator, or some might even view it as secondary prevention. A beta blocker, for sure not. There's minimal role of beta blocker therapy. And quinidine, I'm okay with that answer because quinidine, uh, the therapeutic efficacy of quinidine in syncopal Brugada syndrome is the data coming out of Israel is fantastic. And it, just the question is whether people are gonna accept some of the GI upset of quinidine therapy. Excellent. So we are, here we have another question. ECG tracing is most indicative of 
increased IK1 current, tight ryanidine receptors, DIG toxicity, or decreased sodium current? Go ahead and cast your votes. Good. So here, if we had told you that this, this ECG was during exercise, then you would immediately say this is CPVT. And CPVT is a disease of not tight ryanidine receptors, but leaky ones. So two can't be correct. And so this is one of those where there's the, the pharmacologic ortholog, if you will, of CPVT is digoxin toxicity. So digoxin toxicity can give us this ECG of bidirectional VT at rest, not during exercise. Excellent. And for those that voted increased IK1 current? Right, so increased IK1 current would be an entity that we haven't even touched on really, which is short QT syndrome. And in fact, it would be short QT syndrome subtype three, but you don't need to know that. Here you go for what you were asking me there before. There we go. Perfect. Your patient has this disease, see the ECG, and is pregnant. What is the likelihood that her fetus will be affected by the disease? Right now, before I say anything, let's do the next one, and then we'll, we'll shed light on both of them. All right. So we'll do one more question here. Your patient has this disease and is pregnant. What is the likelihood that her fetus will inherit the disease susceptibility variant? So a little bit different wording there. Yes. Importantly and, different wording. Though. Well, that's what we want to see. Is this just sort of somebody who's a genetic cardiologist and is picky about semantics, or is this actually critically important distinction for our patients? Okay, so what are we getting at? So most, if you didn't know, most genetic heart diseases are autosomal dominant. I feel like that's familiar, but I don't remember. There you go. And so autosomal dominant, we have a genetic transmission risk, which is what this question is getting at, which is a 50-50 chance. So half of the sperm would possess the variant or half of the eggs would possess the variant. That's autosomal dominant, 50-50 transmission risk of the disease susceptibility variant. But the first question asked about the child who inherits the variant being affected or not. That's actually completely uncertain because that deals with the phenomenon of penetrance and expressivity. In other words, you can own the variant and show no sequelae of the disease whatsoever. So transmission risk and phenotypic expressivity or affected status are two completely separate and critically important entities. I might add they're so important that that our course director, Dr. Amon, what was it now, a couple years ago, we created a lecture as an extra lecture in the sidebar package on the basic principles of genetics and genetic testing. And so I, I think everybody has access to that lecture. But it's really important to know this distinction. It's not semantic. And in fact, I loved it. You, you said you used a word that, that made what hair I have stand up on my head. You said carriers? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Carriers? <laughs> carriers, yeah. So that is a, an expression that I want all of you in the setting of autosomal dominant genetic heart diseases to never, ever use. 
So a person who possesses an autosomal dominant disease variant is never just a carrier unless you know that he is 100% non-penetrant because carrier comes from the world of autosomal recessive diseases, cystic fibrosis, where you can carry the variant but have zero chance of showing disease sequelae. Whereas in autosomal dominant individuals, they are variant positive, yes or no. So I prefer that you would think of him or her as being variant positive until you know for sure what is his or her expressivity uh, what is his or her penetrance with respect to that variant? And unless you know that there's zero risk of disease expression in that host, we should always call them variant positive uh, rather than carrier, because carrier will give the impression to them and to the and often to the healthcare provider that they don't actually have any disease risk. They just carry something. And so I'm I'm really glad that you you offer that noun or adjective, but whatever. Wonderful. All right. I think we have time for one more question here. In uh, this ECG, congenital long QT syndrome is most often caused by what? This will be our last question here before the break. All right, so the vast majority got it correct with choice two, still some for choice one. Right, so remember there, and, and I love the 66% because that's the amount of long QT syndrome that is explained by loss of function mutations in those two voltage-gated potassium channels that make our patients either LQT1 or LQT2. Two-thirds of all long QT syndrome are due to loss of function mutations in one of those two voltage-gated potassium channels. The first choice, that's LQT3. And LQT3 is a five to 10% contributor to long QT syndrome. And that's because of the consequence of that variant is to make those sodium channels leaky or gain a function, which remember on the other hand, if you make loss of function in those sodium channels, that is Brugada syndrome. So, so it, it is definitely a cause, but it's just the sodium channels are just a 5 to 10% contributor to long QT syndrome. Fantastic. 